Okay, we'll get started. Let me pull up chat. Oh, okay, so we'll start out um, with a look at the, the schedule, which now has been filled, filled in. We'll see how accurate it is. Okay, um, so I published this, uh, like I said, it's up in the air as to exactly how, how accurate this is gonna be, which is kind of why I was hesitating to publish it beforehand, but after the feedback that I got, seems like a tentative-ish, very tentative plan is better than nothing. Um, so we're here, this is the week of March 1st, um, homework two and worksheet seven are due end of the week. Um, so just a reminder on that. Also, um, the homework and project grades are out. I'm gonna leave regrade requests open until, uh, until Friday. So if you haven't looked at the homework or the project, go ahead and do that by Friday and then grade scope, you can do your, um, uh, uh, regrade requests on there. Um, so as far we're, uh, I've, I have decided we're going to do the midterm on the 22nd. Um, so that is going to be locked in. And like I said before, last day of content that will be on it will be the 10th. Um, so this is a Monday. Uh, that Friday, home, both homework three and project two are going to be due. Uh, I'll release those next week after I finish up and testing the project two starter code again. Or I don't have to do it. My TA has to. Um, uh, and I know it's like right before spring break. So what we'll do is um, let me pull up the calendar. So, oh dear, this is what matters. The 26th is the, is the due date, but then all of this week here until the, the 4th is break. So what we'll do is uh, this will count as one day as far as like late time. So if you submit on the 26th, zero penalty. If you submit anywhere between the 27th and the 4th, it'll be one one day so the 20 percent um and then the fifth will start start uh, accruing more late penalty so that'll be like you know 40 percent so hopefully that should alleviate some of the like it'll you can get rewarded but for you know actually getting everything done before break and then you can have a break that you don't have to worry about anything on or you can kind of only take one day penalty if you just decide to, to delay for that week. Okay. Any questions on logistics? So we'll hop in again. We're we're looking at um, pipelining hazards. Just to recall, pipelining. We're trying to utilize as many of the resources as we can at once. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. We'll go through this very quickly because we've already covered all of this. And let's see. We ended here. Yeah. So we, we finished last time talking about what to do when we have a conditional branch where we don't know until the ALU stage whether or not the branch condition was met or not. Now, 
uh, this is kind of annoying. We have to kill off two, two, then two subsequent um, instructions and then fetch the, the new uh, correct instruction. So that's kind of annoying. We don't, we don't like that. So let's just try and maybe, oh, why isn't this low? That would help if I plugged it in. Uh, so let's let's uh, try and reduce this this branch penalty. Let's try and reduce. Oh, I keep shocking it. Gosh darn it. Uh, let, re, let's try and reduce the number of instructions that we have to kill by resolving the branch beforehand. So um, we can remove one of the bubbles. We can remove one of these kills if we can add an extra comparator on our um, decode stage. And then this would, for example, tell you whether or not the branch is going to be taken or not um, at the decode stage. So now we only have to kill off the instruction being fetched. Um, that's fine. It would work, but this is more uh, circuitry, more transistors to have to do that, and it's going to elongate your cycle time most likely. So probably not going to be um, the best option, but it is an option that we can uh, take a look at. So no, it's not. Thank you for reminding me. Another option that we have is to use these things called branch delay slots. Um, this is effectively saying, hey, um, we're going to expose the fact that we have these, this, uh, this control hazard to the software, or really to the compiler. So what we'll do is we can change the ISA semantics so that the instruction that follows a jumper or branch is always executed. So uh, in this sequence of instructions, we have an add, then we have a branch instruction, and then we have uh, another instruction, instruction at location 104. And this is always going to be executed all the way to completion, regardless of whether the branch is true or false. And this gives the compiler some flexibility um, to put some useful instruction there, where normally you know, we, would have, we would have ended up with a, a bubble. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the further slides, but um, hint, in the future, we'll be talking about branch prediction, which is going to be our, our main solution to, to these problems, um, which is basically just predict whether or not the branch will be taken or not. And that's going to really dramatically reduce the penalty um, that we see. So let's talk a little bit more about how this branch delay slot would work. As we remember when uh, from, from uh, if you took PL or from the very quick review that I did a few weeks ago, um, the compiler constructs a control flow graph. So um, it kind of figures out, well, if this condition is true or false, then we're gonna be going to two different places. Um, and what the compiler can do is, as it uh, turns these into instructions that can be uh, executed by a, uh, um, by a computer, it, as, it, as it assembles this code, it could add in um, uh, instructions right after all of the branch instructions, such that the behavioral behavior of the program is the same, but the um, you know, we don't have to have any, any bubbles. So um, here's, a, here's just a diagram, as you can see, with the branch and then this add instruction is instruction three, we're just going to go ahead and execute it all the way to the, the end. So there's no killing off of this instruction three at all. We can just go ahead and, and execute it. Now, if we don't have anything to put in the slot, we could just put a no op in there manually, and that'd be fine as well. 
So let's take a look at this sequence of instructions and think about how we could uh, schedule them, assuming that we have two, um, two stall slots, two, um, uh, uh, two, two of these branch delay slots that we can uh, put one of these constructions in, into. So instead of just one uh, in this previous example where we only have this instruction 104, we can now have two. So um, let's look at these instructions. The first thing to look at is where are the branches? Well, they're here and they're here. And then the next thing to look at is what values do they depend on? So the branch not equal to zero, this depends on T4. Where is T4 computed? Well, it's computed right here. So it's uh, the sum of T3 and T5. So are we able to move this add instruction to the branch delay slot? No, yeah, that'd be kind of bad if we, if we did that. That would be out of order. That would break our uh, dependence. Because uh, this is a um, read after write dependency. Um, OK, so we can't move that to the branch delay slot. Can we move the sub to the branch delay slot? And again, the question that we have to ask is, uh, do any of these values, do, do, does the computed value depend, uh, then feed into the branch? And the answer is no, we're just putting it into T2. And T2 doesn't feed into to this equation either. So kind of you do a you know, uh, breadth first search or kind of you could do maybe like a, Kind of graph coloring sort of idea to figure out which registers have to have to be computed. And we also notice that T3 and T5, they're not written to by this instruction here. Um, and they're, these, these two are just going to be set earlier in the program. So we can actually move this one down below the branch instruction. So we can only move one instruction down. So we're going to have to add a no op as well. So the, let's look at the second branch. This one involves T4 again. Um, and the question is, can we move any of these instructions below uh, our branch? So what do you guys think? So we have a vote for no, and we have a vote for both. All right, sounds pretty comprehensive of this, the, the different uh, options that the answer could be. Um, so again, we have to look and see what the branch depends on. In this case, it's T4. Well, do either of these uh, set T4? No, this one set T1, this one set T3. And then the other question is, um, you know, are are any of uh, are are any of these going to be a problem? No. Are any of the operands? They can't really be a problem since we aren't even computing the thing that we're branching off of. So we can actually move both of these down. Move both of these down below our uh, branch not equal to uh, zero, or branch equal to zero. And remember, these two branch uh, delay slots are going to be guaranteed to execute even if the branch is taken. Um, so that's kind of the rescheduling. OK, is there a problem with this currently? Yeah. Equals, is the code underneath it what we're deciding whether or not we execute? 
Yeah, okay, so, so what are the semantics of this branch instruction? Um, if you encounter a branch, what it's saying is that if T4 is not equal to zero, then go 400 away, jump 400 instructions. So if it um, is equal to zero, then we continue on. So then if we add, if we move from below, do we get a surge code? So if we move these two below, then we're up. Does it affect the number of, like say that it was branch below like two instructions? Hmm. Moving it below change the instruction of that instruction. Um, yeah, good point. So, so this branch involves a constant number, right? A constant offset. And it's the job of the compiler to keep track of that constant offset. So in, in that case, you would just, the compiler would have to keep track of the fact that it added a new instruction below the branch and then just update the offset accordingly. Um, So yeah, the issue here is that, that we need an extra a stall here. Um, otherwise, we're going, you know, because it's, it's guaranteed that the next two instructions will go, but then we don't know if this branch is going to be taken or not until this is fully resolved. So we're, we can't have two branches unresolved at the same time. And yeah, the, the important thing here is that we have to be able to um, uh, maintain all of our dependencies. So the read uh, after write and, and stuff like that. All right. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about exceptions because exceptions present a problem to us with pipelining as well. Um, there's many reasons that an exception could happen. Um, you could have an arithmetic overflow. Um, so you just run out of bits and you overflow the ints or something. You could have an undefined instruction. You could have just given it garbage and it's like, I don't know how to decode this. You could have a system call. So this would be, you know, maybe you want to read a file and the OS has to give you a file pointer. Um, and exceptions have to be handled basically immediately whenever they're detected. Um, so if we have a floating point error, divide by zero, it has to be handled uh, at that moment. We can't just wait until some time. We have to do it right then. And the entity responsible for handling it, that is the process itself. So it has to have some exception handling logic to make sure that it goes and you know cleans up and uh, that's where it could also then bottle up to the user or something or just seg fault. A related concept to exceptions is interrupt. So these are also reasons that the CPU would stop doing what it's doing. Um, these are caused though by external events rather than some internal issue that, that arose. A couple examples, if a network packet shows up, that's gonna be an interrupt um, hard disk data coming in off of, the, off of the SATA bus is also gonna be an interrupt. Basically any IO is an interrupt. These generally can be handled whenever. Um, uh, is convenient, so so the OS can kind of handle how that works. Um, except there are sometimes going to be higher priority interrupts. Um, if you're say a um, high performance networking application, you probably want to deal with your network interrupts pretty quickly, because you know the the buffer 
for the network packets isn't like infinite. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to pull out a buffer eventually. And uh, the system itself should handle these interrupts. So you know when something hits hits the I/O bus, it's gonna go send a little electron down the wire and flag the CPU. Hey, I'm here. Um, handle me. So again, the reason these are a problem are that uh, the um, the fact that we're doing pipelining can be uh, kind of problematic. Um, the architectural state has to be consistent um, when the exception is 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 being is ready to be handled. And this means that we can't have any instructions that haven't finished. So any previous instructions that haven't finished or uh, in the nomenclature here, uh, they have to be fully retired, completely retired. And also none of the later instructions after the exception should be retired. So these shouldn't be, we shouldn't do a write back on any of those. So if we have a floating point operation uh, and then followed by a add, for example, and the floating point operation fails for some reason, divide by zero or something, um, then we can't do that add. That add cannot hit the register file. So uh, yeah, retire is just is synonymous to commit or just finishing the execution of a uh, instruction. So here's an example. Um, let's just say that we have a, a system where different instructions take different amounts of time, um, different amounts of cycles. So here we have a um, floating point multiply, and this is going to take a lot of cycles to do this operation because it's, it's more complicated. And then we have an add operation uh, where that only takes four cycles. And then down here, we have another floating point, and then we have a few more ads. So basically, what this means is we have some instructions that are going to take multiple, uh, multiple cycles in the ALU, and some that are just going to take one. Now, there's a problem, and that's what happens when we divide by zero and our floating point multiply throws an exception. Well, if we look at kind of the time here, uh, well, this W is after this W down here. So we're gonna have written all of these results to a register file before we you know, fully realize that we're ha having have an exception. Let's say we're lucky and we get to know like even here before we do the write back. Still, uh, we're, we're writing, we're, in the process of writing back on this last instruction. So this is not very good, right? We don't, uh, we've kind of then incorrectly done these uh, five instructions and written the, the values back. So what can we do? Option one, let's just make everything take the same amount of time. So now uh, both floating point and add operations all take the exact same amount of time in the ALU. The problem is that now the worst case latency is determining all the instructions latency. So the worst case in this case, for this example is a floating point operation. And now, well, that's determining how, how long each instruction will take. And the other thing is that we still actually have a high chance for structural hazards. If they're trying to use the same um, part of the, the ALU, for example. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't so fun. Let's do something a little bit more intelligent. What we're gonna do is we're going to add a reorder buffer to the end of our pipeline. 
And we can kind of complete our instructions out of order and then reorder them in our reorder buffer as, as kind of the name hints. The reorder buffer makes sure that we um, uh, write back to our register file in the correct order. So when we decode in the decode stage, we're going to allocate uh, a, uh, a line in our reorder buffer. And then um, when it completes, we go ahead and write it to the reorder buffer. And then when the instruction that is oldest in our reorder buffer um, has completed without any exceptions, then we write it back to the register file. Uh, so. Um, let's just look at an example. I think these diagrams are pretty helpful. Uh, instead of W um, at this stage, we're going to do a R, which is our write it to the read or reorder buffer. And uh, you'll notice that now instead of, uh, we, we go ahead and finish doing the execution and write it to the reorder, reorder buffer. And the floating point also, uh, once it's done, then we'd write it to the reorder buffer as well. And then after the um, this first instruction, this floating point instruction has completed without an exception, then we go ahead and do the write back um, from the reorder buffer back into the register file. And then the next cycles, we can we can continue on with these other ALU operations that finished in the meantime. Um, here's a, an example. So let's just kind of look at a, um, oh, one, one thing to note. Notice now that we have multiple different functional units. So maybe one of these is for a floating point operation. One of these is for, uh, memory and one of them is for ALU or something. Um, and these are different different paths that a single instruction could go on. They all end up going into the reorder buffer to make sure we have a consistent uh, state at the end. So uh, here's our uh, in order pipeline, but we have a reorder buffer. We still have our um, decode stage, we still have our execute stage, um, but they can complete out of order. And then we have to have this, this R stage, this uh, completion stage, where we write the result to our reorder buffer. And then we still have our write back. So, so this, is, this is the same, our fetch and decode are the same, um, but now we have this added step um, of the, the completion step. One way to think about this, we have uh, in order dispatch and execution. So our fetches are in order still. Uh, we complete out of order because of the different sizes and length of, length of time required for each instruction. And then we retire in order because of this reorder buffer. The problem with this is that this extra stage incurs additional latency, right? So we, we have a bit of a, a problem here. We have one extra cycle just to put it into the reorder buffer. So that's not so cool. Before we move on to a solution to this, any questions so far? Because it seems like based on the previous instance, you actually worked on the first instruction execution. So it seems like your last write happens at the same time as the last write from the previous what occurred. Oh, good, good cut question. So it's uh, the question was, it seems like this isn't any worse than what we had with the everything takes the same amount of time, right? Um, so look very carefully at this R. Notice it's gone in this diagram. So that's the difference. 
Um, we, uh, this is the same number of E's, but now we have an R stage after the, the executes and then the write back. So we've, we've added one extra cycle. Yeah, so, th so this, is, this is a good idea. It just sucks because it doesn't actually help us. So let's do something that actually does help us, which leads us to um, uh, a history buffer. So the idea is that we go ahead and write back to the register file, but we maintain some history of what was in the register before. Um, and then uh, this allows us to restore the state of the architecture um, from the history buffer if we run into an exception or interrupt or something like that. So what happens with the history buffer? When an instruction is decoded, we're going to reserve a line in our history buffer. Okay. Then when it completes, we store the old value of its destination in the history buffer. So if we have I will go back to uh, an example up here. If we have an add, what it'll do is it will allocate a line in our history buffer. When it completes, we'll be like, we'll take the old value of R4, shove it into the history buffer, and then put the new value of R4, which is R1 plus R2, into the register file. Okay, so the register file, everything's the same. Um, as as this ex, uh, as uh, let's see, as this example, we just go ahead and do the right. Now, when we uh, complete an instruction without any exceptions, we go ahead and just um, discard that history buffer entry. We don't need it anymore. We won't need to restore that uh, value because. We've, we've successfully completed that instruction. But when the oldest instruction has an exception that needs to be handled, what we'll do is we'll take whatever's in the history buffer and write that back to our register file so that we basically undo any of the inadvertent changes that uh, happened, you know, in, in uh, sorry. In, in these, in these, uh, where's the diagram? This diagram, in these write stages. So even though these are committed to the register file, we have their old values in the history buffer. So when this thing throws an exception, we'll go back and revert all of you know, R3 and R4. Okay. Questions? Yes. If the buffer fills, does it stall? Um, we, yeah, we, we would have to do that, or we could just make our buffer big enough that it won't ever. Like if, we're, if our history buffer is um, at least as big as the number, the the, the max number of cycles it'll take to execute an instruction, then we're fine. Yeah, great question. Yes, uh, somebody on Zoom. Yeah, I, so when you're talking about um, discarding the history buffer entry, can, um, or like what happens if you write to a register multiple times before like the original ex instruction uh, would throw an exception. Like, how does the history buffer? Hit? I see. Okay. So the question is, what happens if um, all of these, like this is an add to, that goes into R4, this is an add that goes into R4, all these instructions are adds that end up going into R4, and then finally at the very end, um, we we realize, oh, in exception here. How do we handle that? Well. Uh, the history buffer is going to store, um, is associated with a particular instruction, 
not with a particular register. So uh, like in this example, we'll have a history buffer line for this particular add instruction that will store the value of R3 before this instruction writes back. And then if this next one is also another add, it's going to do the same, same thing. Um, it'll allocate a line in the buffer, but it'll be the state of um, R3 after this instruction finished. Does that make sense? Yes, that helps a lot. And then, so then the entries get only discarded by the instruction number once like a previous one has succeeded. That, that's how that would work. On discarding, it's also by the association to the instruction. Right, so discard happens according to uh, the age of the instruction. So we wouldn't discard anything until this one has successfully completed without exception. And once that's happened, then we'll discard this uh, line of our history buffer and just keep going. So it's, everything is associated in the history buffer with an instruction, not with the register. And the instruction is basically a, a, a notion of time, right? Of a, a clock. Okay. Yeah, great questions. Any, any more questions before we hit superscalar? All right. Now we're going to talk about superscalar architectures, which you probably haven't seen because um, this isn't really an undergrad topic necessarily. And the idea is that CPIs that are greater than or equal to one are bad. Um, we don't like it that our CPI is, uh, is limited to being at least one. Um, and so let's, let's fix that. Let's try and um, make a superscalar processor that allows us to have a CPI that is less than one. Again, this is cycles per instruction. The other way to, to think about this is the inverse. Instructions per cycle is greater than one. So we're executing more than one instruction per, uh, per cycle. And the way that we'll do this is we'll execute multiple instructions at the same time. So we'll fetch, instead of one instruction, we'll fetch two instructions and send them both through the pipeline at the same time. And that will allow us to actually complete multiple instructions on the same cycle. Um, and this, this whole reordering thing that we just talked about, um, uh, uh, or allowing us to have multiple different instructions ending at different times, that can apply to the superscalar as well, but that's hard. So let's just start with the totally in order superscalar processors. So here's a little diagram of what is going on. So uh, we still have our same program counter pulling out of the instruction cache, um, but now we have um, two lines. So this one and this one. And the uh, we read out of our registers, and then send them through the execution stage over here, and then lastly we write out to the register file. So a few things to look at. First of all, we now have to read four things out of our register file instead of just uh, two things. Okay, so if you recall back to our uh, former examples, we're only pulling two things out of a register file at once. And uh, we're also fetching two full instructions, so not, not just one. We're now fetching two. Uh, so we have two different buffers for these two different instructions. And we now have um, two write ports over here. 
So we have to be able to write back to two different registers, register, um, uh, registers in a register file. So the other thing to note here is that this top branch, it can do two things. We can either do an integer operation, so like an add or something in the ALU, or we can do a branch. So this has its, this is the uh, part of the pipeline where we could evaluate a branch condition. And that goes off and you know controls all that stuff. On pipe B, we can either do integer ops, so we can still do that, or we can do memory. So we can go out to our cache and look at our, our memory and find uh, some data from there as well. So these are the two branches. Uh, we have a problem though, and that's, as you can see it, in here, the change is that we have a bunch of muxers. Um, why do we potentially need this? Well, let's just say that uh, the instruction that we fetched was an add and then a branch. If we, if we have our pipeline looking like this, that's going to be problematic. We can't do branches down here, and we can't do um, memory up here. So we have to be able to reorder and reallocate it to the correct uh, part of our um, uh, our pipeline, which takes more logic, but maybe it's worth it. We also need duplicate control. So we need duplicate decoders, which tell the rest of the pipeline what to do. These decoders also need to tell these mucksters where to put the instructions. And then we have all the same things of, you know, this will tell the ALU what operation to do. This will tell whether or not it's a write or a read in the memory, stuff like that. Okay, questions on this high level idea. Then we'll look at some diagrams or a lot of diagrams. Okay, so let's just uh, look at a, an example here. This is kind of our perfect example where nothing wrong happens. We have a CPI of 0.5 because we're able to use this uh, double issue pipeline where we're doing two instructions at once. Um, so we're able to fetch both op A and op B at the same time. Are you going to need a mux on the decoder as well in case you have to switch the instructions? Yes. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have muxers all around. So you're definitely going to need a muxer to make sure that this is on the right, the, the, the uh, decoded instruction ends up in the right buffers for the control flow as well. Yeah, great question. So back to this, um, we're fetching at the same time, we're decoding at the same time, then we do pipe A, the, the, the first cycle on pipe A, as well as the first cycle on, on pipe B at the same time second cycle on pipe A and second cycle on pipe B at the same time. And then lastly, we write back at the same time. So that's, that's cool. We can then fetch the next two instructions and uh, similar to pipeline, uh, the, the pipeline we've seen before, right? We can start that immediately after the fetchers become available. So we can just go ahead and fetch instruction uh, three and four and then five, uh, five and six. But we still have data hazards, we still have control hazards, we still have all the hazards, so we're gonna have to deal with them. Let's just say we we're doing a bunch of ads, and um, so these first two, luckily they don't have any dependencies on, on each other, so we can go ahead and execute these at the same time. Uh, so they're gonna be just fine. 
then we go ahead and do our uh, R5. Um, our add goes into R5, so we're R6 plus one, and we put it into R5. And we have a problem. This next instruction depends on R5, right here. So we're doing R5 plus one, putting that into R7. And um, we're going to have to wait until it's written back in the right stage. So we're going to have to um, kind of do some uh, delays here, uh, waiting for uh, the, the right back to happen if we don't have bypassing. Now, this bypassing involves bypassing between uh, instructions that were fetched at the same time. So this is a little bit different than the bypassing we've seen already, which is by passing to the next instruction by going back through the pipeline. This is going kind of across the pipeline, if you will. Um, so we're going to have to add some more logic. Yay. With full bypassing, so we can bypass from anywhere in our pipeline, we can change this whole thing to um, uh, now start executing only after one, um, one bubble. The reason is this A0 is where the actual execution happens. So going back here, the actual execution has already happened. We know the value. Uh, so we can bypass that into the, the lower pipe B. And we can start on A0 immediately after uh, uh, this A0 is complete. And I think these should be B. Anyway, that's fine. Just a typo. Implementing this is kind of annoying, though. So we already have a lot of muxers just to get a, get the correct instruction in in from the read. So let's get rid of all this um, and pretend it doesn't exist for now. It still exists. We're still going to have to deal with it. But since we're adding bypassing, we're going to have to be able to bypass from a ton of different places, from the end of here, from the end of here, over here, over here, like lots of different places we're going to have to be able to bypass from. We're going to have to make our muxers super freaking big and add a lot more logic to figure out where we're pulling them from. And it looks ugly, and it should look ugly because this is a lot of stuff. In addition to looking ugly, it also is going to take some some time to do, right? This is going to incur additional latency on top of what we already have. So, one idea is like, hey, this bypass network—it's getting really massive. We're we're pulling in six different streams from multiple different places in our pipeline. You know, before. Like after our ALU stages, after our memory stages, before we write back, all sorts of places. This is not good. Um, let's split that off into its own stage. It's so complicated already. We're going to now have um, a, uh, a new stage, this I stage, where we read from the register file, we do all the bypassing stuff. So those six six lines coming in from later in the pipeline. Uh, and then we also, in this one, we do that uh, steering of the instructions to the correct pipeline. So we put the add on the top one and the memory one on the second one, for example. The issue obviously is now we have an extra cycle, right? So instead of just one cycle to do decode and then also dis dispatch that to the ALU. Now we have two different cycles where we decode. Oh, we can also we can also deal with structural hazards at this point. Um, and then uh, and then we actually do this I stage, this issue stage. All right, any questions? Uh, quick question. What happens if we have uh, like two different um, 
instructions that have to follow the same path. Like for instance, two loads where we both, both of them have to go down the memory path. What happens if we have, have two instructions that have to go down the same path? Um, we're going to have to give up on one of them. So if we have two memory ops, we're just going to have to be like, well, guess we're doing the mem next memory op the next time, probably. Or we can change the semantics of, the, uh, uh, of our um, instruction set architecture such that you can't have two branch operations that are next to each other or two memory operations that are next to each other, uh, at least like in this aligned, uh, aligned case. Those are kind of two options that we could, we could go with. Thank you. And, and that's, that's stuff that we can handle with this, this D stage. And be like, well, oops, this didn't work. We'll go ahead and just split it up or, or kind of uh, uh, go from there. Okay, so let's talk about some more hazards that we might encounter. Um, order matters. So we're still trying to present to the programmer the illusion that we're doing everything in order and then nothing at the same time, even though we totally are. Um, so let's look at this ex example. We have a bunch of ads going into various different places and uh, these two instructions are gonna be going at the same time, and then these two are going to be going at the same time. And the question is, do we have a write after read hazard here, or a possible hazard here? Well, first thing to look for is like, do we have any registers that are the same anywhere? Uh, R1 is only used up here, so that's kind of fine. Um, R3 and R4 are only used in this instruction. R7 is only used in this one, R6 is only used in this one, but R5 is used on both. And we notice that here on this first ad, we're using it as an operand. So, so we're reading from it. And on the second one, we're doing a write. So we just have to be a little bit careful here and make sure that we do the read before the write. You know, in this case, we're doing the read over here before the ALU stage. Um, and then we're doing the write way over here. So, so we're okay on this, but it's possible. Like uh, if, for example, you were really fancy and had both pipelines able to access memory, then you might have a problem. Um, where you're trying to, you need to make sure that you do the read before, before you write to the register file. Okay, another problem presents itself in that um, our fetches may get out of alignment. So the, here on the left, we have our clock cycle. So zero, one, two, three, et cetera, all the way down. And uh, we don't really care what the operations are that much, but let's look and see what this looks like in memory. Let's just say we have, uh, we can store four instructions per cache line. So the first instruction is gonna be in the first two uh, or the first two instructions that are going to be in the first two places in our cache line. Uh, so that's great. We can just fetch in the single cache line, read them from the first two, um, uh, first eight bytes. And then the next instruction, the same thing. But then we do a jump and we go down here um, and we're still aligned. Yay, we're, we're, we're just fine. Um, to our, our, our cycle number two are going to be fetched from these two locations. We just pull in a single cache line, everything's great. Then we jump again down to 200 and this is also okay. This ends up being in the same cache line. Uh, it's, it's a little bit offset from the start, but we're fine. This is, this is all right. 
And then we jump again, and now we're a little bit misaligned. So now we're over here at um, uh, 300 or something, and we have a problem. Our next two instructions are split across two different cache lines, this cache line and this cache line. Fetching across multiple cache lines is hard. It's very hard. Um, and the reason is just kind of a practical one, you know, the pulling in multiple different things from, from your cache into the, into the CPU is going to take time. And if, if we have this misalignment, that's going to be annoying. We're going to have to pull in two lines just to dispatch these two different instructions. That's not so fun. Um, obviously, this is ideal, though. We don't want it to be the case that you have to have everything aligned properly. Um, the ideal is that we are, yeah, we can let the programmer do whatever, whatever they want as far as where the instructions are. Um, we can have misalignment. Who cares? But like I said, that requires that we have a lot more uh, logic in our fetch stage just to get in the instructions. So what actually we probably are going to have to do is, is add some constraints uh, on the alignment of our instructions. So uh, now, instead of just being able to jump willy nilly, we're going to have to also add some no ops into our code just to make sure that everything's aligned and our fetches are always going to be coming in at uh, uh, the same cache line. OK. The last thing is that um, branch is still, uh, what is a no op exactly? A no op is just it does no operation at all. So it just, when it hits any stage, it just, oh, I'm not going to do any operation. I'm not going to write back. I'm not going to do any computation. The last thing is that superscalers multiply our branch costs significantly. Um, we have already seen that branches are annoying, and we'll see it even more once I start on the next slide deck in a, in a minute here. But uh, they're even more annoying when we fetch multiple instructions, right? So now instead of having to kill only, you know, let's just say two or three instructions, we're having to kill like six um, because we're fetched, we fetched multiple instructions at the same time. And if this branch ends up being taken, so we actually do the branch, now we have to kill off this entire slew of operations. Um, so that's another disadvantage of superscalar architectures. Um, OK, any questions? What do the dashes represent? That just represents that we've we've killed off the instruction there. We can't proceed. Um, and those are that we send a no op through the rest of the pipeline. Cool. Other questions? OK, so apologies. I haven't posted these slides yet, mainly because they're not totally done. I still have, this is a long slide test. I will get them up over the weekend. Um, but, you know, we only have about 15 minutes. We're not going to get too deep into it. Um, and I'll have them to you as soon as I can. Um, OK, so we've, we've seen branches are, are kind of the bane of our existence. They cause us to have to kill off a bunch of instructions, right? So 
let's figure out ways to handle this in such a way that it, it kind of helps that situation. Maybe we can reduce the, the cost of it somehow. Uh, we can, we'll get to this fairly quickly as well. We can try and predict whether or not it'll be taken or not. There's a lot of different things that we can do. But I want to take a little bit of a sidebar first into fine-grained multi-threading, which is one way of reducing the, the cost of uh, our branching operations. And the idea is that we can have hardware that has multiple thread contacts. And each cycle, the fetch engine is going to fetch from a different thread. Okay, So uh, let's just say we have 10 threads. We're going to select one of those threads to execute on each different uh, cycle. And by the time the, the fetched instruction resolves, no other instruction from that uh, same thread has been executed, has been started. So if we have our, our same MIPS pipeline, which is five, five stages, and we have five threads, well, by the time you get back around to your thread, that the previous instruction is already done. It's gone through the entire pipeline. This is pretty nice because all of your branch and instruction resolution latency um, is overlapped with the execution of the other threads. Um, because the other threads are executing while you're figuring out whether or not you take the branch. And by the time you figure out what you're, whether or not you're taking the branch or not, you are, uh, that's right when you're starting to execute the next instruction from that thread. So a pro of this is uh, no logic is needed for handling our control and data dependencies within a thread. So this is the key, within a thread. Um, so here's a little diagram as well, where we have our instruction um, and operands coming in. And we kind of can see here um, that we're, we're doing uh, all of the, in our pipeline, we're doing our, stream, uh, our, our thread three, stream three, stream two, stream one, stream eight, et cetera. And so we're doing all of these at different uh, points in our pipeline. And um, yeah, that's, that's the general idea of this. So the cons are fairly numerous. Single threaded performance is gonna suffer, right? Our latency just quintuples or even more, depending on how many threads we're cycling through. There's gonna be extra logic required for keeping track of these thread contexts. So more muxers, more transistors. Um, and then our latencies um, are also not going to overlap if we don't have enough threads. If we can't parallelize our, our code enough, our workload enough, we're just gonna have to stall and, and wait for, for stuff to finish. If we have, say, uh, is cycling through 10 different threads and we have two, we're gonna have fairly low utilization. Um, so these do actually exist. Mainly they're not used these days. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time going over these. If you're interested in these uh, machines, I, I recommend going and, and looking at them on your own time. But uh, I want to highlight a few advantages of these sorts of systems. The first of which is that to each thread, the processor is going to look like it's non-pipeline because really it is um, for, for that thread. We're, we're stacking them one on top of, uh, one after the other. We aren't stacking them on top of each other at all. Um, we're, we're interleaving the different threads together though. Also, um, back to what I was talking about earlier, right? You, you still have a, um, you have some single thread performance hit, but your overall throughput, this is the advantage, right? You, you can 
you could potentially increase it if your application is conducive to uh, being able to um, be parallelized and distributed across these multiple threads. So let's look at a couple of diagrams. Here is one where we have now a bunch of program counters. So instead of just one program counter, we have a bunch of them, one for each of our threads. We have a thread selector, which tells us which instruction, which, which program counter to use. And then we also are gonna have to separate out our register files. So now we have different register files for all of our different thread contexts. Again, more complexity, but if you are able to saturate your pipeline with different threads, this could be really good. And uh, so the, the Sun Niagara um, processor did this. Um, again, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time, but you can kind of see we have our thread select logic. It's gonna use a bunch of different inputs, um, instruction type, number of misses for each thread. Um, if it's missing a ton, maybe it'll like make it wait a, a little bit or maybe it'll prioritize it. It, it'll, it, it can do either. Um, various interrupts, resource conflicts, IO, stuff like that. Uh, we have our third selection logic and then our instruction cache. Um, we actually have an instruction translation look aside buffer as well up here. And uh, then we, you know, we're going to go and use our, our same uh, sort of pipeline. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then obviously we have way more register files. So four different ones. So let's talk again. Let's talk about the pros and cons um, definitively now. There's no need for dependency checking between instructions in the same thread. So this is because we only have one instruction at a time from our thread. We don't have any conflict. There's no need for branch prediction, which is complicated as evidenced by the fact that this is already uh, 153 slides long. There's a lot of animations, don't worry. Um, and I'm not done. Um, we can also utilize anything that was a would have been a stall or a bubble of sorts uh, for another thread. The other thread can be doing something useful, even if we can't. And our overall throughput for the system is increased, um, and that's all amazing. What happens if you're running more threads than the processor supports? So that's where probably your operating system would have to intervene and kind of schedule the different threads. So you have an additional like kind of mm, kind of circular uh, thing there um, where you wanna put in some threads, prioritize them for a little while, put in some other threads, et cetera. Great question. What would happen if there's less threads than the hardware requires? You just have to wait. You'd have wasted space or wasted time on your processor, which is uh, this, uh, let's see. I don't think I've listed that con in this list. It should be here. So here's, here's the cons, right? We have, diff we have more complicated hardware. We have more program counters. We have more register files. We have the thread selection logic. We've got all sorts of stuff there. So we're just gonna have more stuff to do in hardware. We're going to have reduced single threaded performance because we only have now uh, one, of, one instruction fetched every n cycles from the same thread. And we can still have resource contention between threads. So we, we haven't actually addressed this problem. We still have resource contention on cache and memory and stuff like that between two different threads. They could be trying to access the same cache line or something, or they could be kicking each other out of the same uh, cache line. And we're still going to have to do some checking of dependencies between threads, um, especially when it comes to memory. So we're still going to have to deal with memory coherence protocols, which is gonna suck. So it doesn't fix all of our problems. And 
In fact, as you could tell by the fact that, well, Sun's a now defunct company, and this is kind of the, the quintessential example of this, and it's been defunct since like, I think before I was born. So yeah, this is not very common, but it's just an interesting idea, right? We're trying to, again, we're trying to obscure the fact that branches take a while to figure out whether or not we take them or not. Which leads us to branch prediction. Um, the idea of this is to guess the next instruction that we're going to send. So here's a fairly extensive animation that will kind of introduce us to this idea. So let's just say we've executed all the instructions up to this branch. We need to know whether or not we just continue on. So the branch isn't taken, we just keep going through the execution or if it is taken and we jump back up here. So this is probably representing a loop or something, right? Where we just loop and we do this add a bunch of times. So what do we do on this next instruct, uh, next cycle? We're just gonna probably, we're gonna have to stall um, and then uh, down here, once we've determined um, whether or not the branch will be taken or not, or not, then we know, oh, it wasn't taken. We can keep going on to this add instruction. So this is without any branch prediction. This is just, we have to wait until the instructions finished. Then we know whether or not to take the branch and then we fetch accordingly. So all through, all through these cycles here, we have no idea what we're doing. And then here, our program counter, oh, we're good. We know that it's 04. Then from there, you just continue on. So that's all, all well and good. The problem is this white space. So let's try and get rid of this. Uh, this is wasted CPU time. The CPU is doing nothing, but it's still on and using power and using time. With branch prediction, what we're going to be able to do is guess. We're gonna say, we're gonna assume that we're just gonna always take it or not take it. We're gonna always just assume that it's PC plus four. Um, and we're, instead of doing a stall for a while, we're going to go ahead and fetch uh, this next instruction, this add instruction. And then we're gonna keep going. We're gonna fetch the multiply instruction. We're gonna move the, the add into the decode stage all the way down. And then uh, at, the, uh, at the end, once we've determined that the branch is in fact not taken, everything's good. So we don't have to worry. We can just keep executing. There's no more white space. And we've cut off four of our cycles because of this guess. So this is the general idea of branch prediction. We're going to try and figure out, oh, make an educated guess as to whether or not it will be true or not and act accordingly. The problem is, well, you might've guessed it. What happens when you mispredict? So you guess wrong. You're gonna have to flush your pipeline. That's going to be problematic, right? So uh, let's say we're uh, we're at um, we're finally writing back our branch, and we found out that we have to take it. We're going to have to go and flush this entire pipeline, kill off all of these, and uh, you can now see that the gray one, even though it got all the way to the ALU stage, now we have to just cut it off. Yellow one got all the way here, cut that off, etc., and then we've determined that we do actually have to take this branch. We'll go back up and load it in on this next one. So we have some penalty uh, for this uh, misprediction. Okay. So hopefully this has whetted your appetite for things to come. There's gonna be a lot of intricacy of different ways that we can, can deal with this because it's a very important topic. All right. Um, you guys are dismissed. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
office hours uh, office hours have been moved to Friday, so no office hours uh, this evening. 